Shukran. Thank you. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, Excellency Sheikh Sabah Al Khaled Al Hamad Al Sabah, President of the Security Council, Excellency Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, Excellencies, Excellencies, members of the Security Council. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of God be upon you. Seventy years have passed since Palestine's Nakba took place. Since then, six million Palestinian refugees continue to suffer from the cruelty of exile and loss of human security. They continue to wander the world after the loss of their peaceful and stable lives in their homelands. They are part of the 13 million Palestinians whose country has yet to be recognized as a full member state of the United Nations. Despite the numerous resolutions reaffirming their right to self-determination. and despite resolutions reaffirming the right to statehood as well on their national land. Excellencies, we are the descendants of the Canaanites that lived in the land of Palestine 5,000 years ago and continuously remained there to this day. Our great people remains rooted in its land. The Palestinian people built their own cities and homeland and made contributions to humanity and civilization witnessed by the world. They established institutions, schools, hospitals, cultural organizations, theaters, libraries, newspapers, publishing houses, economic organizations, businesses and banks with wide regional and international influence. All of this existed before and after the Balfour Declaration issued by the British government in 1917, a declaration by which those who did not own gave to those who had no right. The British government bears responsibility for the catastrophic consequences inflicted on the Palestinian people as a result of this declaration. Since then, and although our people remain our, under occupation, they continued their journey, building and developing their country with the establishment of the National Authority in 1994. Our national institutions are recognized by international organizations for their merit and work, which is based on the rule of law, accountability and transparency, and empowerment of women and youth in an environment of tolerance, coexistence of civilizations, and non-discrimination. Moreover, we continue to strive to unite our people and land, and to ensure one authority, one law and one gun. And we are determined to convene parliamentary and presidential elections. Mr. President, Excellencies, our conviction is deep rooted and our position is clear regarding the use of arms of any kind. Not only do we call for the dismantlement of nuclear weapons, but we are also opposed to conventional weapons, which have caused such vast destruction of states in our region and around the world. We have thus been committed to fostering a culture of peace, rejection, rejection of violence, pursuit of sustainable development, and the building of schools hospitals, industrial zones, agricultural farms, and techno technological production, as opposed to establishing weapons factories and purchasing tanks and fighter jets. For we wish for our people to live in freedom and dignity, far from wars and destruction.
We really want for our people to live in freedom and dignity, far from wars and destruction, and far from terrorism and extremism, which are being relentlessly combated in all areas of the globe. Accordingly, we have become party to 83 security agreements with states around the world, 83 states around the world, including the United States, the Russian Federation, and other European countries and other countries as well. Ladies and gentlemen, why are we here today? After a long journey and tremendous efforts to create a political path based on negotiations which could lead to a comprehensive and just peace, as you are aware, we participated in the Madrid Conference in 1991 and signed the Oslo Accords in 1993. We were alone with the Israelis and the Norwegians, you know that. This, these accords, the Oslo Accords, affirm the imperative of reaching a solution for all permanent status issues before 1999. Unfortunately, this has not become reality. Therefore, we should wonder, why has it yet to be achieved? Nevertheless, we persisted in our efforts to reach peace. We engaged in dialogue at Y River and Camp David. We participated in the Annapolis Conference. We engaged in dialogue with the former Israeli Prime Minister Olmert for eight months. Eight months. And we met with Prime Minister Netanyahu in the presence of former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and George Mitchell. We also accepted President Putin's invitation to meet with Mr. Netanyahu in Moscow, but he has regrettably evaded participating in such a meeting. We also engaged with all seriousness with former Secretary of State John Kerry, but the Israeli government's intransigence caused the failure of all of these efforts. After all of this, how can it be said that it is we who reject nego negotiations? We have never refused any invitation to participate in negotiations. Please do not say that we rejected negotiations. We believe that negotiations are the only path towards the peace. So how can we reject negotiations? Please believe me, this is not true. Confronted with this deadlock, we have neither given up nor have we lost hope. We have come to the United Nations, believing in the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations, which affirms, inter alia, the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by force and affirms the right of peoples to self-determination. Article 40 and 41 reaffirm that. Nobody has held Israel accountable when it occupied our territories in 1948. So the Charter affirms the rights of people to self-determination, which are among the issues this August Council will address tomorrow. We continue to engage with all of its agencies and bodies in our quest to end this occupation of our land and people. Yet, in spite of, of all of that, the United Nations has failed to implement its relevant resolutions until this very day. Is this possible, ladies and gentlemen? Is it logical that, despite the adoption of 705 General Assembly resolutions, 705 resolutions, from 1948 until this very day, and 86 Security Council resolutions in our favor, from 242 to 334. None of them have been implemented. Where are these resolutions which your August Council has adopted? 86 resolutions with no result whatsoever. Is it logical that Israel violates its obligation to implement resolutions 181 and 194? If you remember, these two resolutions were 
a sine qua non for, it was a condition for Israel to be accepted at the United Nations. And Moshe Sharet wrote a letter. He said that he was ready to implement these resolutions. And because of this commitment, Israel was accepted at the United Nations. But until this very day, these two resolutions have yet to be implemented. 181 and 194. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel is acting as a state above the law. It has transformed the occupation from a temporary situation as per international law into a situation of permanent settlement colonization. It, Israel shut the door on the two-state solution on the basis of the 1967 borders. Here, we must reaffirm, as we have done in the past, that our problem is not with the followers of Judaism. No, Judaism is a monotheistic relig religion, as are Christianity and Islam. Our problem is only with the occupiers of our land and those denying our independence and freedom disregarding their religion. Mr. President, we met with the President of the United States, Mr. Donald Trump, four times in 2017. And we have expressed our absolute readiness to reach a historic peace agreement. We repeatedly reaffirmed our position in accordance with international law, the relevant and resolutions, and the two-state solution on the basis of the 1967 borders. Yet, this administration has not clarified its position. Is it for the two-state solution or for the one-state solution? And then, in a dangerous, unprecedented manner, this administration undertook an unlawful decision which was rejected by the international community to remove the issue of Jerusalem off the table without any reason. It decided to recognize the city of Israel's capital and to transfer its embassy to the city to Jerusalem. It did so ignoring that East Jerusalem is part of the Palestinian territory. It is occupied since 1967 and it is our capital, which we wish to be a city open, open to all faithful or all the faithful of the three monotheistic religions. Especially Islam, Christianity and Judaism. It is also strange that the United States still lists the Palestine Liberation Organization on its terror list, and it imposes restrictions on the work of our mission in Washington under the pretext of congressional decisions since 1987. And most recently, it has decided to punish the Palestine refugees by way of reduction of its contributions to UNRWA, in spite of the fact that it supported the agency's establishment and it has endorsed the Arab Peace Initiative, which calls for a just and agreed solution for the plight of the refugees in accordance with Resolution 194. The United States has contradicted itself. It has contradicted its own commitments and has violated international law and the relevant resolutions with its decision regarding Jerusalem. No country alone can solve a regional or international conflict without the participation of other international partners. Therefore, to solve the Palestine question, and this is our position and our belief, it is essential to establish a multilateral international mechanism emanating from an international conference and in line with international law and the relevant resolutions to solve the Palestinian question. A multilateral international mechanism. Mr. President, 
Faced with Israel's policies and practices in violation of international law and its non-compliance and non-implementation of agreements signed, our Central Council, the highest Palestinian parliamentary body, decided several weeks ago to review the relationship with Israel. Yes, we will review the relationship, considering that we have become an authority without authority and the occupation has become one without cost. We are working for the occupation. We are working for the occupation. We are employees for the occupation. And we say that Israel must uphold its obligations as an occupying power. And in spite of this, I could, I, Confirm to you our commitment to maintain our institutions and achievements which we have realized on the ground in Palestine as well as the international arena. Thanks to your assistance, we are determined to remain committed to the political, diplomatic and legal path far from any violence through political negotiations and dialogue, which we have never rejected never rejected. We will continue to extend our hands to make peace and we will continue to exert efforts to bring an end to the Israeli occupation based on the two-state solution on the 1967 borders and international legitimacy as per the relevant resolutions in order to achieve our national aspirations. However, at the same time, we will continue to oppose any attempt, regardless by whom, to impose solutions that contradict this legitimacy. Any solution that contradicts this legitimacy will be rejected. We have been granted the status of non-member observer state by the General Assembly. And on that basis, we have become a state party to 105 international treaties and organizations. We have been recognized by 138 states. All of this has further strengthened the status of the state of Palestine, which continues to strive for recognition by the rest of the states in the world, among which members of member states of the council that have not yet recognized the state of Palestine. even while knowing that recognition of the state of Palestine is not a substitute for negotiations. Recognition does not go against negotiations. It rather promotes negotiations. And in the future, we will intensify our efforts to achieve admission to full membership in the United Nations and to guarantee international protection for our people. We will, come, we will come to the Council. We will come and call for international protection to our people. We hope for you to support our efforts to ensure the rights of 13 million Palestinians who yearn for an independent homeland, just like all other peoples of the world, and yearn for their state to take its rightful place in the international community. I say 13 million Palestinians. And you say that's not true, but we are. We are 13 million Palestinians, whether we live inside, inside Palestine or in other foreign countries. We come here before your August Council, ladies and gentlemen, in the midst of the deadlock of the peace process due to the U.S. decision regarding Jerusalem, Israel's ongoing illegal settlement activities, and its violation of the resolutions of the Council and its disrespect of the signed agreements, latest of which Resolution 2334. We are here because of the Palestine, Palestinian side's desire to continue working positively and courageously. We have courage to say yes and we have full courage to say no. This all relies on the international law. 
and our interests. We are here to, be, to build a culture of peace, to reject violence, to save the principle of two states, to attain a security and stability for all, to restore hope to our people and the peoples of the region, and to find a way out of the stalemate and crisis we are in. Therefore, I will tell you about our plan. First, we call for the convening of an international peace conference by mid-2018, based on international law and the relevant UN resolutions, with broad international participation, and including the two concerned parties and the regional and international stakeholders, foremost among them, the, member, the permanent members of the Security Council and the International Quartet, as was the framework for the Paris Peace Conference and as envisaged for the conference to be convened in Moscow as per Resolution 1850. So we call for the convening of an international peace conference. The conference in Paris was attended by 74 states. So the outcomes of this conference should be as follows. One, acceptance of the state of Palestine as a full member of the United Nations. And this is what we deserve. Don't you think we deserve to be a full member? Why not? And we call on the Security Council to achieve that. We will come to you, taking into account General Assembly Resolution 6719 of 29 November 2012, and guaranteeing international protection for our people on the lines of 1967. The formation of an international multilateral mechanism that will assist the two parties in the negotiations to resolve all the permanent status issues defined in the Oslo Accords. According to, to the Oslo Accords, Jerusalem, borders, security, settlements, refugees, water and prisoners are to be resolved through an agreement by both parties. conduct those negotiations on the basis of the international law and relevant UN resolutions and implement what is to be agreed upon within a set time frame and with guarantees for this implementation. Two, during the period of negotiations, all parties must refrain from unilateral actions, particularly those that would prejudice excuse me, prejudge the outcome of a final solution as set forth in Article 31 of the Oslo Accords of 1993. And any settlement. Foremost must be the cessation of settlement activities in the territory occupied since 1967, including East Jerusalem, and suspension of the decision regarding Jerusalem and holding trans transfer of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, because this thwarts negotiations. in compliance with the relevant Security Council resolutions, including, in particular, resolutions for 476, 478, and at the same time, the State of Palestine would refrain from further joining organizations as we have previously committed ourselves to, namely 22 international organizations out of 500 organizations and treaties.